And this is what I know. God is here always. God is love. God is harmony. God is joy. God is peace. God is ever present. And that same God, that same harmony, and that same love is also in me, through me, around me, as it is everyone in this room. And I declare for tonight, for Reverend Arpad's talk will be so inspiring to all of us. Grace is what we all need, what we all need to hear. And I give thanks for this knowledge. I give thanks for this beautiful center that's led by Reverend and Dr. Heather and Reverend Judy tonight. I am so thankful and I'm so grateful for this. And I release these words into the law, knowing that my words are heard, knowing that it's true, knowing that it is, and so it is. And so it is. My demonstration, this is, um, I can't keep my big mouth shut. I'm always volunteering for something, and then I get into these messes. Um, <laughs> like this last week, chairing a Christmas party for 35 women. And, um, but I prayed and I prayed and I had help praying. <laughs> and it just went so smooth. Everything just, and I was so nervous, I was just like a cat. But everything was so smooth. Everything went exactly like it should. And there were no hiccups, nobody complaining, and that's usually what happens with this bunch of women. Um, <laughs> but it was so nice. It was so rewarding. And when it was over, I just sat in the car and thanked God a thousand times for the demonstration of love and peace. Oh, that's a perfect demonstration, especially with 35 women and no complaints. It truly is a blessing. <laughs> it's great. So I kind of mentioned that, you know, it's kind of been a stressful week. And, you know, for a lot of us, um, I don't know about you, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but around the holidays, there's so many different things added to our schedule. Lots of things to do, lots of things to get done. And, uh, you know, we just, you know, we just kind of feel overwhelmed sometimes. And I found um, something here in the Science of Mind uh, magazine, which I thought was appropriate for us to hear today as we go into the 14 days until Christmas. <clears throat> and it's, if the heading is the joy of doing nothing, you know? So Norman Vincent Peale said, learn to relax. Your body is precious as it houses your mind and your spirit. Inner peace begins with a relaxed body. Good words. And Ernest Holmes on page 136 said, but only when the mind is tranquil, like a unruffled body of water, can it reflect the divine image of peace and perfection. So only when we're at peace can we reflect that perfection. And then it goes on to say, being busy can be a good thing. Getting things done that they are important to, to you, helping someone out, working towards a goal. I can easily become a master of a multitasker. These days, once the need of multitasking is done, I consciously slow down. If I feel stress building, it's time to look at how I'm spending my time. Am I balancing my busyness with any downtime? 
If not, I wrap up or I let go of existing projects and I think twice about taking on the new ones. Taking deep breaths, I start to eat, walk, and drive slower, consciously releasing stress and returning to a calm state. My whole being, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, benefits from these periods of doing nothing, absolutely nothing. Being in idleness without any expectation of productivity allows me to rejuvenate. I might take a nap, stroll through the neighborhood, play with a pet, or lie on the grass watching the clouds go by, letting my downtime simply unfold the way it wants to. This didn't come to me naturally. I had to learn to relax. I had to learn to unwind. I had to learn to do nothing. To build a new habit, I practiced daily. I chose one chair and sat, closing my eyes, without any expectations. That chair soon became my calm place. I know several of you have your prayer chair that you go to or you do your reading and your meditating and your praying. That would be your calm chair. The, chair, the, mo the moment I sat down, I could feel my body and my mind start to relax. It's a natural react reaction. I sit quietly, quietly, thoughts coming and going, uh, my body loosening and unwinding. A beautiful new habit was being born. Those days when I feel stress building, I sit, I return to my calm place, and I'm worth it to take every break I can. So, yeah, and you think, I don't have time for that. I don't have to take time to sit and be calm or, you know, wake up an hour earlier or something. You know, that's what I had to do. I didn't, once I was up and hit, hit, the, hit the floor, it was, all, it was go, 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 go. So take some time for yourself. And then I wanted to read a little something about today's uh, message. This is from the uh, Daily Word of Unity. Uh, I accept my gift of divine grace. The grace of God is a powerful gift that I receive with willingness throughout my spiritual journey. In the parable of the prodigal son, when the young man in the story came to himself in the far country, his father rushed to greet him even before he reached the gate of his home. The young man's desire and effort to return was more than matched by his father's joyful and willingness to meet him. When I receive this kind of divine grace in response to a spiritual need, I do so by being willing to say yes to the help that I seek. You know, sometimes we just block it off. We have to be open to receive that help. Thank God. This inner decision opens me up to my divine response as I access my spiritual resources from within. I am a willing recipient, recipient of grace. And that just sets us right into our wonderful speaker tonight, Reverend Arpad Petrus. He is speaking on the power of grace. Reverend Arpad. Thank you, Reverend Judy. Woo. Oh. The power of grace. That's the topic for tonight. And I'll tell you, I love this topic. Uh, Joyce on Facebook said, it's my favorite topic. Yes! One soul change, just like that. It's my favorite topic because every 
every time I talk about grace, every time I talk about grace, it's a reminder to me that, Arpad, you're falling asleep. You're not awake. You're not conscious. You are forgetting who you are. Every time. Because what is grace? You know, it, grace is like this old word. In traditional religion, you see, you hear people talking about the grace of God, or God is doling out grace, or God's grace. And what does that mean? It, it kind of reminds me that God's given out candy. Okay? No. You do not have to do anything to get grace. Grace is all around you. It's above you. It's through you. It's around and over and above and through and behind. Remember that, that little, little cliche thing, whatever we say? It is everywhere. It's in nature. It's in people. It's in relationships. It's in your enemies. It's in everything. Grace is God revealed. Um, to me, grace is a tool. It, it's a tool for you to practice trusting God. It's a practicing tool because it's about this personal relationship that you are having with spirit. You know, Cheryl Robertson wrote this great book about grace. I don't know if you know who she is, but she, um, she's she been an Oprah. She's a writer. She's a life coach. And while she was researching the book, she talked to many people of different religious beliefs. And all of them were passionate about their religious belief, but all of them said one thing. You have to name your God. Okay, now in AA, they say, don't name your God. But these people were saying you have to name your God because the, the reason is that it's that personal relationship you're having. It doesn't matter what you call it. God, Spirit, Buddha, Krishna, Mohammed, Babalu, Mother Earth, Father Sky, newspaper, I don't care. But it's your relationship with Spirit that you're going to develop. And I'm going to use the word God because I like it. It's comfortable for me. Or I'm going to use spirit. You know, in religious science, we say spirit a lot, right? We don't say God. It might offend someone. It's okay. I don't care. Um, because that's what I'm comfortable with. Okay? Now, many years ago, well, let me ask you a question before I go. What do you think grace means? What's grace for you, since we're all adults here, we've gone through a whole lifetime of hearing that word, either when we were younger and we went to some other religious organization, or we grew up in you know, a different religion, or we didn't grow up with anything. What do, you, what do you think grace is? Just shout something up. Yes? Grace to me is, it is the, the manifestation Do we have a different opinion of what grace is? Just put you on the mic. Yes. Um, it made me think of, um, okay, we're supposed to move through the world making a soft carbon footprint, mm -hmm. and I feel that that's moving gracefully, not causing any trouble, not taking away from what's already been made and manifested. All right. Do you have a, a different opinion of what grace is? Oh, back there. There we go. The man. Reality. What reality? The ultimate reality. The ultimate reality. The ultimate reality. <laughs> and the deep voice says the ultimate reality. All right. So we have 
already in this room three different opinions of grace. I'm going to define grace in what I think it is. I think for me and for the sake of this talk, grace is a benevolent energy connected to the divine that somehow has influence on my life. That's how I'm going to define grace. Okay? A benevolent energy. Because for different people, grace is different things. It's not the same thing. It's going to be different for Gene. It's going to be different for Richard. You know? We all come from different backgrounds. So long before um, I ever went to a religious science church, I would observe young kids, and, and I had this knowingness that children are still connected to God. They're still connected to God. And, and I observed that even in my own children, is when they were little and they were playing, you know, by themselves, I saw both of them at different times having a conversation with God. They don't even know about God. We never taught them about God yet. But they were talking to something. They were talking to a higher power, some higher angel, some higher consciousness. Something was talking back. So, you know, when we say children have uh, uh, imaginary friends, are they really imaginary? Are they really imaginary? See, I think what happens as we come into this world is we all, by divine plan, will experience spiritual amnesia. The example of the children is they're still connected. They remember the joy and the glory and the magnificence of where they came from. But I think there is a reason that we begin to forget because why else are we here? We're here to, you want to know what your life purpose is? To be the best you that you can be, period. The best you, what is that? I don't know. But it's the best you. And you have to experience that, but you have to forget to remember. Right? That's what I think. So just imagine that you are born and, and there's this magnificent canvas, a portrait of you. It is magnificent. Your hair is perfect. Your clothes are perfect. Your skin is perfect. Everything is perfect about you. You like it. You radiate. You glow. And you are this magnificent creation. That little child is that creation. But then spiritual amnesia comes in. And you begin to forget. You begin to grow up. And you begin to, to experience life in the way it's coming at you. Suppose you just got this brand new outfit and you're six years old and your parents tell you you look fantastic and you go out in the world and you say, hey, look at me, everybody, and then somebody laughs at you. <laughs> so it's like taking a tomato, boom, right at your canvas. And then suppose somebody teaches you as a kid, boom, another tomato is thrown at your canvas. And suppose you get older and you go out on a date and uh, you get rejected or you have a bad experience. Another tomato and another tomato. Suppose it gets worse and suppose you get a divorce in your life and now it's a big watermelon on top of your canvas, okay? <laughs> and before you realize it, your canvas is totally covered in gook. You can't see out and the world can't see you in. So what does grace do? It prepares you for the process of removing the gunk on your canvas as we go through life. Because it's okay. To, the Buddhists, they don't ignore the fact that there's struggle, do they? No, they embrace it and they figure out how to work around it and acknowledge, okay, I'm having a bad day. Let's see what we can do about it today. Let's work through that, right?
you have any examples in your life of where you feel like you're unconscious? I'll give you an example that we probably, everyone in this room has probably done at least once today. You have a conversation with somebody and you're just not there. You're thinking about something else. And uh, they're communicating with you. They're real. They're human. They are, they are exchanging ideas and you're not quite focused. You're not present. Anybody have any other ideas? <laughs> Driving. Driving. Go ahead. Say more. How'd I get there, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like if you go to work every day and you go the same way to work and now you're not going to work and you're going down the road and you go, wait a minute, I'm not going to work. Why am I going this way? Anybody have other experience of that? Yes. Complaining. Complaining? How so? Well, I have no intention to complain. Uh -huh. But it does happen sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so being, we are kind of always unconscious. And grace is saying really out loud, hey, Arpan, hey, Judy, hey, Heather, hey, June, wake up. Something's not right. Something's going on. Wake up, guys. I'm here for you. I am behind you. I am your support. I am going to take care of you. I'm going to nurture you. I'm going to drive you in the right direction. But you got to trust me. Oh, my God, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound terrible? Trust God. What? That's scary stuff. It's really scary stuff. And you would never trust God unless you have proof. Right? Unless you have a demonstration, like Cheryl said. She had a demonstration. Well, she connected the dots. I had an issue. I prayed. I let it out there. Oh, my God. It turned out okay. Whoa. Check the box. Proof. Right? Isn't that a prayer? So getting, getting back to Cheryl Robinson. Uh, when she wrote her book, she realized that... Uh, um, there were stages that people were going through in grace. And it wasn't like you go from one to two to three to four. You could be in any different stage at any given time. And I thought that the, uh, the first three stages were kind of interesting uh, that she wrote about. The first stage was the awakening, the great awakening. And when, when you have this awakening, usually there's something going on. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you got a divorce. Maybe somebody died. Maybe your health uh, is so all of a sudden deteriorating or you get a bad diagnosis. Something's going on, and God, spirit, is gone. I'm here for you. You. Hello, I'm here. Hello, I'm here. Hello, listen, I'm here. You were going through stuff this week. What do you think? You think it was a coincidence that spirit was knocking on your door? No, not at all. Not a coincidence at all. So this awakening makes you want to do something. Okay? because it's trying to get your attention. The other thing that she talked about um, was psychological healing begins to happen. And I find this really fascinating because in the West, we have such an aversion to psychological healing that we will go and talk to a counselor or a therapist or a minister or a practitioner for some reason, to share our stuff because we are too weak and we won't go. And I think that's ridiculous. I really think that's ridiculous. Because when you work on your stuff, it prepares you for your spiritual growth. Yeah? Yeah. You know, I'll give you an example. I've been talking a lot about retirement you haven't noticed, right? Because 
retirement is real to me. After 45 years of doing entertainment, okay, so I'm going to give that up. Then I worry about, well, look at how much you're leaving on the table, man. you got a good salary. You're going to stop making that salary? Where is the rest of the money is going to come from, right? So I worry about these things. But I decided that I was going to look at my life and work on my life so I don't bring that baggage into retirement. And I'll tell you, it's very tough because you start seeing things that you don't like. You start seeing patterns that you've created. You start looking at decisions you've made and you go, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's much safer to be in the fear because you know it, it's familiar, it's really safe. You know the outcome. If you do something stupid, you know what's gonna happen. You're gonna do the same stupid thing over and over again. And it's comforting. But to, to, to make that decision that I'm gonna change and become something different, that takes courage. And psychological healing takes courage. And you have to work on your stuff, but it takes courage. And the third thing, that I'm not going to give them all to you, but the third thing was coincidences begin to occur. Okay? The reason that's important is because once you trust these coincidences, you begin to see that it's not a coincidence at all. It's the power of grace working around you and through you. And it's showing up. So here, here was a, one of the Examples I was reading about. Um, there was this uh, hairdresser, and, and she's talking to her friend, and she says, "Yeah, I've been working on this thing called uh, what is it? Uh, box." She's working on this product that's basically like a loofah sponge with suction cups on it. That you put it inside your shower, and you kind of, you know, get to the spots <laughs> you can't get to normally. And she's been working on this for years. And, but she never did anything with it, right? It's a great idea. She had developed and all this kind of stuff. And uh, so one day her, her husband was calling the uh, um, credit card company. And uh, he got a wrong number. And he, what he wound up getting was the U.S. Patent Attorney Office by mistake. And they got him in a conversation. He goes... Well, he says, what do you do? He says, we're the patent attorneys. Uh, uh, what, what? And he goes, oh, my wife's got this great uh, patent idea. And, well, anyway, to make a long story short, that conversation, by mistake, now, was it a mistake? Was it a coincidence? No. They developed a product. She had it in the market within six months. Wow. Is that a coincidence? Does anybody else have a coincidence? Was there a job that you ever had that if you took and you realized years later, oh my God, look where it got me. Or look where I got to. Or look what I didn't do. And I did this instead. Anybody? <coughs> Coincidences are real because it's God working around you and through you. There is a prayer that says, um, let's see if I get this correct. I am open and receptive to grace. Let me sh be shown clear examples of grace operating in my life. Very simple. If you start your day, every day, with that little prayer, guess what's going to happen? You're going to see all the people, all the events, all the situations where grace is operating in your life. Have you ever read a good book that just changed your life? Let's see. Celestine Prophecy, uh, Conversations with God, uh, The Secret. Any other books? The power you of your subconscious mind. Power of your subconscious mind. Anybody else? Science of Mind textbook. 
Slides of Mars. That was, that was a hot seller, let me tell you. Slides of my textbook, man. Louise Hay, Fill Your Body. Yeah. yeah. There are books that are written by people that just overwhelm you with truth and wisdom. And you don't know why. Remember Shirley MacLaine? The actress Shirley MacLaine out on a limb and she's talking about her experiences in the jungle and and Seth and, and all these incredible books and people. Grace is everywhere. It's around you, whether you like it or not. Grace is always preparing you for the next special or big thing that's going to happen in your life. Think about that. You're always in training. You're always working on something. And what are we calling it? What are you calling your grace? What are you calling your God? What are you calling that name so you can have that personal relationship with? So we're going to do a little meditation. I think we have time. Yeah. We're going to do a little meditation, if you're willing. Um, and then we'll end. And we can talk about it if you want. Okay? Okay. Exhale, if you would. And take another deep breath and begin to feel more and more relaxed. And just feel the energy of life just swirling around your head, swirling around your shoulders, releasing all that stress that builds up in your shoulders. Stress of the day. this journey we become free we become relaxed we begin to transport special place where we're all safe. A place of great beauty. A place filled with flowers and trees and birds and animals. place. 
Jesus. Filled with love. As we begin to walk around in front of us, a great house. As you walk towards it, you feel safe and joyous because inside someone is waiting for you, just you. further in brings you to one hall with two doors. You get to choose the door on the right or the door on the left. It makes no difference. Ask Spirit to help you. Which way should you go? You made your decision and you walk through and there on the other side is a very that you trust, a person that you know, so you open the book, with great loving tender care, so you say this is the book of truth. This has been your life. These have been your choices. These are your decisions. Just take a moment and flip the pages of this book. Tell us how we can help you to move forwards to the next chapter in your life.
say thank you. the book. Begin your journey back. As you walk ever so slowly out of that room, know that that blank page to write itself. It is choosing you to be its vessel. And slowly return back to this room. Back to your chair. get anything <laughs> that they want to share or is everybody good okay and if you did not get anything that's okay too because it takes time to listen to understand when the spirit is talking to you it's never a big trumpet it is gentle, it is soft, it is personal, and it's in a way that you understand. Just remember that grace is around us, it is a tool, it is a message, it is a way of connecting to your personal connection with God. Namaste. Yes.